Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my new video. So as you can see, there's never a dull moment. Every single day, there seems to be some major news happening somewhere around the world. And Niger seems to be the main headlines at the moment. And I'm going to give you my thoughts on it and a lot of other stuff that's happening around Ukraine and the rest of the world. And before I start, don't forget to join my new channel. The link is in the description. This is because um, this channel's got two strikes already. So I'm, I'm really afraid that YouTube one day might completely cut me off. I just want to have uh, another YouTube channel ready to go. And, um, and yeah, don't forget to like and share. I really, really appreciate it. So let's not uh, waste any more time and let's carry on with the show. So, as you know, that Niger has recently uh, done a coup and military has taken over Niger. And the French do not like it and the EU do, do not like it for a number of reasons. And the main reason is uranium. Niger is the world's, one of the world's biggest sources of uranium. And France has been absolutely getting that uranium either for free or either for very cheap because 80 percent of niger people still live without electricity it's a very poor country so they are literally robbing their resources and not giving anything back so rightly so there's been a coup in niger and united states had said that they're going to stop aid to Niger if they uh, don't put the previous puppet government back in place. Uh, the military leader, the general, has said, you know what, keep that money and save it for your homeless, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. And the reason the French are getting all worked up is because, as you know, French, the, France has many nuclear facilities and it's one of the reasons why France has been able to keep its uh, energy prices down because they've not been able to obviously buy Russian gas from Russia. So it's been pretty much self-sufficient with a lot of nuclear energy. And uh, and where do they get all of the uranium from for the nuclear energy? That's that's right. Around 30 to 35 percent of it comes from Niger. The rest of it comes from other countries like Kazakhstan and even they buy it from Russia but they don't want to rely on Russia so mainly they buy it from Niger and also the EU buys probably 25% of it from Niger as well and they get it very cheap by the way it's very very cheap or if not even free in fact so Macron is shouting you know he's going up 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 and down, jumping up and down like a little uh, Napoleon. And he's thinking of basically doing some airstrikes against Niger. So I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, when there's a coup which doesn't satisfy the West, they want to airstrike the com country, kill innocent people, and that's their way of um, of basically dealing with coups. But when there's a coup that happens in Ukraine, right, when it benefits them, their Newland is giving out cookies, they're out there, you know, basically saying it's freedom, freedom, you know, these are people are free, these let these people be free, it's freedom of expression, the people have spoken. But when uh, Niger wants to do it, they want to airstrike the country and kill as many civilians as they can. Well, not this time. It's not going to happen anymore because a couple of other African countries have said they will declare war on France or anyone that airstrikes um, Niger. And you have to also understand the timing of this. This has happened one day after the Putin and African summit that was held in St. Petersburg. The Western papers were saying, oh, what a failure this um, summit was and, and blah, blah, blah. But this is the result. After, one day after the summit, you know, Niger decided to cut off France, cut off the West. Uh, they already have a lot of investments from China and, um, and they want to go along 
those routes. So the West is obviously not happy about it because the uranium is very important to them. Um, if they don't have nuclear power, then uh, they'll be forced to buy more natural gas from Russia and, uh, and they don't want to go along that route. And it's ex extremely embarrassing for them. I mean, the prices for uh, energy in UK has gone through the roof. Even though the gas prices are, have gone down considerably, the bills, uh, people's bills are still the same. They're still paying well above the odds. And these uh, British gas companies are making huge profits. A couple of days ago, British Gas uh, announced profits close to like a billion. And none of that money goes back into the people. None of that money goes back into the bills. These gas prices will still stay high. People will still have to pay ga high gas prices while they're making a profit because the actual spot price for the gas prices has gone down. And th this extra profit is just going to go to the shareholders. And these shareholders are most, mostly companies that are not even based in Britain. Uh, we're talking about US companies, Canadian companies, French companies. So it's an absolute joke, guys, absolute joke. So you see energy, cheap energy is very important for Europe and they're willing to go to war over it. So Niger has got a new friend, um, Russia. So they're talking about bombing Niger, but I don't think Russia will allow that to happen. I believe the Wagner troops will probably go into Niger at some point and try and protect them. And uh, Russia will probably send um, some troops and uh, nuclear subs and other heavy machinery or weapons to protect their interest in Niger. And, th and the reason I say this is because Putin did promise a lot of African countries in the summit that uh, he's there to help them become sovereign nations and he will help them get away from the West. And I believe uh, Niger will also get help from China as well. China's got a lot of interest in Niger at the moment. So uh, things are changing. Things are changing very, very fast. I want to go over some Twitter feeds right now. If anyone uh, uses Twitter, make sure you follow me. The, again, the links are in the description. Now, I'm probably going to do this uh, for a number of videos now. I'm just going to go through some of the latest information that I found in Twitter. So let's go through some of the more recent information. So you can see uh, the president of Burkina Faso has banned uranium exports to France and United States, which is absolutely hilarious. So they also get um, a lot of uranium from um, this country as well. Those of you who follow movies and Hollywood, this used to be Ellie Page. Uh, now she's turned into a bloke. And she's turned into a real ugly bloke as well. And it's a shame because she used to be very pretty. Uh, but now she's just an ugly man. And one of the things you guys have to know is because um, she has been basically, to become a man, she's been injecting herself with lots of testosterone. And one of the side effects of testosterone is obviously she's been losing a lot of the, her hair and she's gone absolutely bald. Half of her head is gone, you know, there's no hair in half of her head, so she has to go through a top transplant. And she's also getting hair in unusual places where she shouldn't be getting hair. So, I mean, I just don't understand why some women want to be men. I mean, I just do not understand. I mean, she used to be so pretty, right? And I, I, mean, I just do not get what's the, the thought process of, of, of wanting to be a man. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Anyway, this is a geopolitics channel, so I just uh, let's not talk about that anymore. Um, you can see Burkina Faso has announced they will declare war if Western-controlled um, nations invade Niger. And again, this is another top story there. Um, there's news apparently that Gonzalo Lira has been released on bail. So obviously I can't confirm it, but, you know, we'll see what happens over the next few days if it turns up. 
So this is a story I wanted to cover. This this is a crew member, four crew members in one Russian tank. And this Russian tank basically took out an entire convoy of Ukrainian um, Bradleys and armoured vehicles. And they took it out. It's, uh, you know, like Rambo, they call it, the, the, the Russians are calling these guys the Russian Rambos. And I think, um, I don't know if you've seen this clip. This is the clip. This is the article here. Massacre of Ukrainian attack on Zaporizhia. Russian T-90 tank destroys a Ukrainian column of eight tanks and uh, vehicles. And this is the actual clip. I want to kind of show you quickly. You can see the single tank basically takes out all of these armoured vehicles and stuff and destroys all these uh, vehicles that are parked here and it takes them out one by one and it's just an amazing video an amazing thing to see and uh, these guys are basically heroes for for doing what they did and um i think this is another clip here you can see we'll take the sound down so you can see like these column of um, armored vehicles coming in and you can see the russian tank here speeding up uh, towards them and once and what it does it, it kind of sets itself up behind these trees and starts firing from behind these trees and you can see these uh, vehicles are, st are starting to get destroyed one by one and at one point it reverses all the way back because uh, i think what happens is it calls for backup from russian um, art artillery and so it reverses all the way back and artillery artillery starts uh, raining down on these armored vehicles and once artillery barrage stops and uh, the russian tank comes you know forward again and starts um throwing um you know missiles and, and rockets at these column column of vehicles and they all got this get destroyed and i think that i want to show you this clip where he kind of races past again uh, it, there you go see after the artillery basically destroyed another few few tanks see can you see it uh, racing back i think what they also done is they went all the way back and reloaded as well oh it's gone sorry guys they went all the way back and reloaded and they came straight back and started um uh, destroying the other co the column of vehicles. So you can see, you, you, if, you, if you've got Twitter, you're welcome to kind of have a look at this video. It's just, it's just a great thing to see. And it's good to see people with good skills in the battlefield. Uh, I've not seen anything like this for a long time. I mean, I, I, grew, up, I grew up in the two Iraq wars, and there was no skill there, guys. All it is is just airplanes dropping bombs. Uh, and that's all all they did really just drop bombs use drones to kill as many iraqis as possible and afghanis as possible i haven't seen any skills in the battlefield like this so it's really good to good to watch if you uh, if you have a chance to see it have a look so let's talk about sweden now sweden uh, in sweden outside the swedish parliament the third quran has been burnt outside and parliament and the Swedish government have obviously allowed this to happen and this is absolute hypocrisy by Sweden yeah. and by the West as well because NATO and other Western countries have supported this however the hypocrisy goes a long way you can see here the um, Swedish Sweden allows the Quran to be burnt while they silence uh, people that talk about um, Jewism or the Holocaust and Frank critic. So they happily ban anyone that talks about um, Jewish stuff. Uh, but they will let um, you know Islamic stuff go ahead. And you can see here, Swedish officials pick and choose when they want to when they want free speech. And this goes. This, this is the same exactly for Ukraine as well. So, 
obviously, you know, Sweden doesn't allow anyone to talk negatively about Ukraine. You cannot do anti-Ukrainian um, protests in Sweden. If you talk about Ukraine in Sweden, you get shut down immediately or get cancelled or get, you know, basically, they only pick and choose where they want free speech. And this is absolute hypocrisy. And for Western countries to support this kind of behavior is it, it, totally out of order. And this is why countries in the global south do not trust the West. They just pick and choose when they want free speech, when they want democracy. When it suits them, it's fine. But when it doesn't suit them, you know, they're proper, you know, cancel that person or put the suit or shut them up or put them to jail. They do whatever they can. Uh, whether you talk um, negatively about Ukraine, whether you talk about Jewism, they'll shut you down. But if it's about Islam, oh, go ahead. Who cares about the Muslims anyway, right? So again, this is why the Muslim world doesn't trust the West. And actions like this is just alienating them. And this brings me on to to NATO, really. So I want to kind of talk about Sweden and and I want to say how idiotic it is for Sweden to join NATO. Because if you look at this map, you can see that Sweden is absolutely surrounded by NATO countries. So you've got Finland here on the east, you've got Norway on the west, on the south you've got you know, all the, the rest of Europe, Germany, Poland, rest of Europe, and then you've got UK, then you have the Baltic states absolutely surrounded by NATO. So Sweden doesn't need to join NATO. They're absolutely safe, right? Because to get to Sweden, they have to get through NATO first, and not many countries are going to be doing that. So it's much safer for Sweden to stay neutral. This way, they get all the benefits from the West, but they also get all the benefits from Russia and the, the rest of the world. So I just do not understand why they just can't stay neutral, why they have to, why there's a big rush to join NATO. But the way they're acting, I have seen an article in the um, in the British papers. Uh, this was like a few months ago, and I can't seem to find it. Uh, but the article was basically stating that. Sweden is doing everything they can not to join NATO. So all of this stuff with the um, Quran burning, all this stuff they're doing to annoy um, Turkey. Um, also, Hungary have recently voted they, they won't allow Sweden to join NATO. And also, you know, don't forget the done deal. You know, it's not a done deal with Turkey yet. Turkey still has to vote whether to allow Sweden into NATO or not. And Sweden still hasn't done all the stuff that Turkey wanted with regards to the Kurds and many other issues. So people are saying that Sweden is basically is not doing, working hard enough to join NATO. And they're doing all of this stuff in, to basically destroy their chances of joining NATO. Because if they are doing it, I mean, I'd rather give them the benefit of the doubt, and um, I would like to say they are clever, and but however, I, I just do not think so. I do not want to give them any benefit of the doubt. And I just, I think all of this stuff is just um, coincidences. I think Sweden will join NATO, and all these um, countries like Hungary and Turkey will. You can, be, they, you can give them a bit, bit of money, give them, a, give them some few bribes, and they will allow. Sweden to join. But the fact is, you know, if there was anybody clever running that country in Sweden, they, they would look at the map and they will think, you know what, we don't need to join NATO, we're safe. I mean, we're completely surrounded by NATO countries. And if there's a nuclear war, which they might be, at least we stay, we stay neutral, we stay out of it, we you know, let the rest of Europe burn, and we can just stay out of it. And I mean, that's the clever thing to do. I just do not understand why they're in such a rush to join NATO. It's suicide, if you ask me. So let's look at the next story, shall we? So there's been a bombing in uh, in Moscow, and there's been obviously um, bombs have hit the financial center, 
a lot of drone attacks going into Moscow. And the news coming out of China uh, this morning, uh, basically you can see this. This is because of these all of these bombings that's happening in Moscow. And Ukraine has been using a lot of Chinese drones. So China basically restricts um, controls on drone exports. Restrictions on unmanned aerial vehicles and components will have potential impact on both sides of the Ukraine war. So can you see how the Western papers are saying both sides on the Ukraine war? What they don't want to say is that Ukraine is probably buying more Chinese drones than the Russian side are. And they're using these drones to obviously attack um, Moscow and stuff. So, so Russia's probably said something to China, saying, "Look, you know, your drones are basically used to, to attack our capital. So, you know, do something about it." And China has, has well, this is what China has done this morning. So, going back to the drone attacks, I just think that it's time for Russia to stop. You know. Um, to, to kind of stop um, defending now, and I think that it's, start, it's time for them to advance, take Kharkiv as soon as possible, and take Odessa, and, the, and completely cut off Ukraine from the Black Sea. This will basically allow a couple of things. Number one, it will stop a lot of the weapons going into Ukraine from the sea. Um, and that will kind of stop a lot of weapons being attacked into Moscow. Secondly, uh, if they take Kharkiv, um, they're going to have to, these drones will have to fly longer distances to get into Moscow. Right now, because they haven't taken Kharkiv, um, these drones are basically can be flown from the northern parts of Ukraine uh, across the border into Moscow. So there's a, there's a big gap there, and uh, and I think that's that's an issue. So they need to kind of take Kharkiv and take uh, some land north north uh, at the north of uh, Ukraine, and um, and definitely take Odessa. And if they do take Odessa, um, I think that will probably be the end of um, Ukraine. To be honest, I mean that is taking taking Ukraine away from the Black Sea. That's a huge economic hit. And the Europeans and the Americans will look at Ukraine thinking, you know what, we don't want to deal with the Ukraine anymore because um, they're not attractive anymore because um, they've taken the Ukraine's biggest asset. Because Ukraine's biggest asset was access to the Black Sea. And uh, without that, they just become a rump state uh, with huge amounts of uh, infrastructure issues, huge, huge amounts of population issues, because most of the men are pretty much dead or injured, and you know, and the Europeans don't want to touch Ukraine anymore because it's just going to cost them too much, and the Americans don't not going to really care. They'll just move on to the next thing, and uh, and now obviously you've seen Poland and Lithuania causing trouble, and they want to go into Western Ukraine and stuff. So I just think that um, it's in Russia's interest to kind of take Kharkiv and take Odessa as soon as possible if they want to stop attacks to to Moscow. So this article is saying that U.S. intelligence is basically saying that Ukraine will be partitioned and uh, they want to partition Ukraine to Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine. But again, I don't think Russia is going to agree to it because, um, first of all, this is a special military operation. And the whole point of this special military operation is to denazify Ukraine and also destroy all of its military. So if there's a partition of Ukraine, all Ukraine is going to do is start building up troops again, building up his military again. Um, like, for example, 2014, when Russia took back Crimea and they stopped the war and they decided to kind of agree on these Minsk, Minsk Accords, so Minsk 1 and Minsk 2. And, uh, and it was just uh, Ukraine buying time. They were buying time to get uh, more weapons from NATO, get more training from NATO. 
And you can see from 2014 to 2022 how stronger they have become, uh, just under 10 years. So Russia is not going to want that anymore. You know, if they allow uh, Ukraine to be partitioned to east and west, uh, if NATO controls one side, they're just going to militarize that side again and give them more weapons, give them more training, and 10 years' time, they're going to, you know, they'll start attacking um, Russia again. So Russia's not going to allow that. Their main concern is to denazify and demilitarize Ukraine, and they're not going to stop this uh, military operation un until those goals are satisfied. So this article with the US um, talking about partitioning, it's not going to work. It's never going to work. So finally, I want to talk about the idiot of the day. And the idiot of the day is the Lithuanian government. So embarrassingly, the Chihuahua country of the European Union, they are absolute Chihuahuas of the West, Chihuahuas of the US, and... Um, they bark like a chihuahua every time the U.S. asks them to do something. So these, this country, who thought itself like a big, big player in the European Union, it's only got a population of two and a half million. Uh, most of the Lithuanians have moved out of the country into U other European countries, and they've only got an army of maybe 20,000, 30,000 troops. And the, this small country is basically thinks it's strong enough to fight against Russia and fight against uh, China. So one of the things they did, did against Russia, it blocked the railway going into Kaliningrad. And with China, obviously, it pulled out of the Belt and Road and pulled out of the, um, the Baltic states um, railway lines um, to China. Uh, pulled out of many investment deals with China, and he started um, interfering with China's internal affairs and started opening up Taiwan embassies in Lithuania as well. And Lithuania was basically the barking chihuahua of the European Union and the United States against China. And he was doing the same thing against Russia. He was talking tough, talking big. However, they've had a change of heart uh, about two days ago, and they started, um, they reversed the decision to lift the rail restrictions. And they also, the, the leader of Lithuania, I can't remember his name, but he said he wants to make uh, friends with Russia again, and he wants to be friends with Russia and friends with the West at the same time. So what's changed? Why, why do you think he's changed his mind and, and started... Um, the little chihuahua is basically, um, rather than barking, is now, you know, basically um, sitting still like like a trained dog, not saying anything. I mean, why is it, why the sudden change? Because he knows NATO's not going to protect Lithuania. You know, if Russia goes into Lithuania and they go there for a reason, because um, the reason is uh, Lithuania has blocked transport to Kaliningrad. So they broke a really important treaty, and Russia's got every right to go in, go into Lithuania and open this channel again. And they've got every right to do that. And Russia recently um, agreed in their parliament that Lithuania is not independent, and uh, they became independent illegally. They didn't get any um, approval from the Soviet Union, and uh, so that gives the Russia the right to go into Lithuania. And I think the Lithuanians are basically scared. Um, they think, oh crap, you know, maybe we should shut our mouths because Russia's not gonna Russia's not here to mess around. And if Russia goes into Lithuania, I can bet you my whole life that NATO will not interfere. Absolutely not. You know, NATO is all about money and the day and expansion. The only reason NATO is trying to expand is because it needs money. It's, it's for the military industrial complex to sell American weapons into Europe. And you can see most of the NATO countries, um, they have to be compliant with American weapons like the F-35 and all these other American weapons. So what do you think has happened to all of these European um, 
jets that they built, like the Typhoon and uh, the Eurofighter. They've basically been um, put on the back, and they've all been replaced by the F-35. Um, they've all been replaced by American weapons. So NATO is a really good way for the military-industrial complex to make money. And this is one of the reasons why they're trying to extort more money from NATO. They're trying to make more countries buy American weapons. And they need a threat, and the threat is Russia. If they allowed Russia to join NATO, then there would be no threat and NATO would be dismantled. So this is all Americans' plans to basically make NATO into um, an alliance. Uh, and all this Article 5 crap, it, it's all crap, guys. It's, it's all bullshit. But you can see how all of these leaders in Europe, they all you know, when they get together in their G7 or their summits, they're all there hugging each other, talking to each other. They, they like having this champagne reception they love having their little parties and get togethers they don't care about ukrainians dying and and that picture of zelensky standing by himself while everyone else is you know smiling and uh, being happy and talking to each other and and not having a care in the world while zelensky is there by himself you know thinking what the hell what the hell is this group so these guys they don't want to die in a nuclear war they you know they want to be they they want to carry on going to these champagne parties. They want to live the high life and stuff. So all this Article 5 is, is never going to trigger Article 5 if Russia goes into Kaliningrad. The only country that doesn't mess around right now is Russia. And Russia is, is a country that goes in, a, a, you know, whatever Russia says, it does. And... Um, and NATO will not jump in and have a nuclear war with Russia just for little Lithuania. Lithuania thinks, oh, we're protected with Article 5. NATO will come and save us. The Americans will come and save us. No, it's not going to happen. Trust me, it's not going to happen. Because um, NATO wants to expand in Asia now. Their focus is on China. They're not going to start a nuclear war with Russia, destroy all of Europe. And like destroy all of America and for what? For Lithuania? No, no way. They will not do that. So if Russia goes into Lithuania and uh, puts a land bridge towards Kaliningrad, uh, the Americans won't do jack about it. NATO will not do jack about it. NATO's got no weapons left. It's basically spent. It's given up all its weapons to Ukraine. Given up all its resources. They've got no money. No hardly any weapons. They don't have a manufacturing base. So there is no way uh, NATO would win in any war with, with Russia. And yeah, so that's all I wanted to say. So the idea of the day is the Lithuanian government. And the uh, little Chihuahua has uh, suddenly shut up, basically. So let me know what you guys think. And I'll see you in the comment section. And see you soon, guys. See you in the next video. Take care for now.